Hi, thanks for, thank you all for coming. So first lesson of today, if you make a spicy talk topic, people show up. <laughs> and let's talk about the end of the enterprise Linux distribution, or well, not really the end. So first maybe, why should you listen to me? Uh, hint, hint, you shouldn't, but you can, and now you're stuck in here, so you have to. Uh, my name is Dan, I'm a software developer, I work for SUSE, and I mean, actually, my job title says software developer, but currently I've been doing more or less release engineering for the past two years. I do stuff also in the Fedora community, hence my attendance here, and then other tech stuff. But let's, let's get maybe to the actual meat. And so I'd like to first take a look where, where, did, we, where did we get from, where are we now, and maybe describe a little bit the, uh, what, I'd say, what I'd call the downward spiral that we may be caught with, with our rels and slices and whatever else there exists. And how can we get out of this mess without containerizing everything or modularizing? Because that has worked out so well in the past. And at, at the end, the obligatory roasting session. So, where did we start? some 20 years ago, and uh, yes, that doesn't mean in the 1980s, so more like it, the early odds, but also in the 90s, when all this enterprise Linux distribution star, uh, stuff started, the world looked very different. So we had pet servers. Admins had a few servers in some mainframe. Every single one of them had their name on them, and it wasn't just a serial number. They knew them by name, it was all set up manually. These servers, they stood there for ages and ages. And you would install your software just from system packages because that was the only place to get them. And in some places, you also didn't really have a stable internet connection, so you got your DVD, sorry, CD, or floppies, and that were your RPMs were. Because you didn't wanna use dial-up for that. Uh, and if you wanted to develop software, that was really also only the only place where you couldn't get your packages from, because there was no NPM. And maybe fortunately or unfortunately, but there was also no PyPI. So, and also software development cycles were kind of long. I mean, waterfall was the main development paradigm. So if you get a release out in a half a year, you were good. Now you have software that releases every week. And there was also a lot of machines that you just set up and then you never touch them again. And they would kind of do their job until the hard drive fails in 10 years down the line and then you start hunting down the machine uh, and the admin who did that and you realize that they quit and their successor quit and their successor and well, things sucked. Uh, but things have changed. Hopefully we now have cattle servers and you use some automation for that. You should. Otherwise, you are in a, I mean, you please use Ansible or, or Puppet or, well, if it comes down to us, use Salt, but don't, don't use shell scripts. Don't do it manually. Development has sped up a lot. So, as I said, you have projects that release every other week. There's projects that release every month. It's rather rare for to, so if, if you go to a project on GitHub and you see last commit half a year ago, is that even alive? If the, co if the last commit has been two years ago, the project's certainly dead. So th things have evolved in that area. Also, our dependency trees, they're getting bigger and bigger, and this is not, not just Node.js. I mean, we've given up packaging Node.js, but uh, it's also in Python, it's in Go, it's in Rust. And then containers. Containers have completely changed the way how software is deployed. But there's also the other issue, the old way is still there. Because there's people who, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say refuse to learn, but who just, for whom the old way works. Because if you're a small business, you just have one server and you don't need Kubernetes to deploy everything. 
I mean, you can if you want a lot of anti-fun and two additional IT administrators, go for it. But uh, so now, now, now we are in this weird split position where one, uh, where we have one part or a, a part of the world is moving at accelerating speeds, pulling in so, uh, a ton of software, pulling in containers, and then we have people. Then we have big companies who maybe deploy a ton of uh, a ton of machines, and then they don't want to touch them for another decade or two, and they want things to still run and continue running. Well, and the problem is that our enterprise distributions, they, they kind of still work the old way. We make a release and we maintain it for a long, long time, or as we call it, all eternity, so something like 15 years. And uh, that's, that's kind of a problem because nowadays, Long-term support is getting harder and harder. So if you take a look at um, my, my employer's enterprise distro, the latest release, less 15, the default Python is 3.6 because that was the latest, that was the Python version, that was the latest when SLE 15 was released. And our promise is your code will not break if we update things. So if your code worked with Python 3.6, it's still going to run. It's going to run for all eternity, so something like 15 years, give or take a few, probably more. And, but that me, that's not really appealing to me as a developer nowadays because Python 3.6, cool, I want this package. Oh, no, it's not compatible with Python 3.6. And that one as well not. Um, yeah. And maintaining something that's so ancient is getting increasingly expensive because upstream abandons these, uh, these things rather quickly. And hence, it costs more money. So you have multiple options. For instance, well, just well, let's just get rid of packages because that's the obvious business decision. Um, you can do that, makes you less appealing or you update packages during the long-term support cycle, which makes you more appealing to developers. It makes maintenance maybe easier, but then you're gonna break for those customers that we're relying on. I wanted Python 3.6, and I was expecting Python 3.6 to stay here for all eternity, so 15 years. And uh, so you are in this uh, weird split position, so what, what can we do? And then there's the other problem, we literally cannot package the world anymore because there's just too much stuff, and also we shouldn't, because what, what value do we add by that, by just converting PyPI packages to RPMs? That's, if, if that's all you do, then don't. You're not adding any value in there. So we get caught in a nasty downward spiral where, okay, so we don't, th this is not really appealing, so let's put in less packages. And, uh, and then there's missing dependencies for developers. So that means it's not really interesting to develop on that anymore. If I want to develop stuff, I do it on a recent, uh, on a recent release of, a, of something like Fedora or OpenSUSE and not on the long-term release stuff. And if I don't develop on it, I'm sure as hell not going to deploy on it because I didn't test it there. And that means I'm also not going to use it. And if there's less users, that also means there's less paying customers for that, which means less money for development, which means you have fewer packages, and so on, and so on, and so on. Yeah, so what's, uh, w what can save us? Well, maybe. Containers can, because containers give us the ability. Uh, they will. Uh, we can just write our application. We can just put it all in a container, and you can run it on the enterprise distribution. And that all sounds nice because there's a lot of stuff running on OpenShift. There's a lot of stuff running on Rancher, and there's somewhere less underneath. But the problem is, it's really just the the, the enterprise distro in this scenario is demoting itself to be just the container runtime and nothing more. 
if you take a look at Slee Micro or CoreOS or how, however many different, uh, and, uh, different container running distros there are, all they really do is you have, a, you have the base OS, you have the container runtime, and then they run stuff from Docker Hub. And most of that is based on Alpine, Ubuntu, and not on the stuff that we want to make money from and that will ultimately pay our salaries. We might make money from the, from, the uh, from the support of OpenShift or whatever else you use to run your things, but it's still not the enterprise distro. And then there was the other plan, modularity, which started out, I guess, as kind of a, kind of a wet dream of someone. Let's, let's piece together a distribution where we, we give the customer the option, you just have your base OS and then you, you put together yourself the compiler that you want, the libs that you want, the software development stacks, and it's all, it all sounds very, very nice, and uh, unfortunately and, and, uh, it went all down in flames, uh, mostly for actually unrelated reasons, but the big problem with this idea is really the following. This is the dependency graph of just a core set of OpenSUSE tumbleweed of the ring of the so-called ring one. That's yeah, that's the that's these are the dependencies of ring one. So that's kind of the second bootstrap cycle. Do you see any isolated modules in there? Because I sure as hell don't. And this is, so, uh, and so the, the whole idea of this works very nicely if all these modules are isolated and there's small interfaces. No. That's, not, that's not the case. So as soon as you add a module, you have to test it against all other modules. And if you have, if you have streams of, let's say you have three Python versions, three OpenJDK versions, two OpenSSLs, you can start calculating how many possibilities you have to test, and you can't test that in practice. So this, this doesn't work. And so, since I'm a well-known pessimist, so uh, should we just all give up and say, okay, it, we, we are gone in 10 years, and see ya, or 15, or whatever. But that's not true. I mean, we are still adding value as an enterprise. So if you want to, if you want to scare people, uh, run Trivi on, on the Golang container. This is just a snapshot from w whenever. Uh, yeah, I mean, 255 low vulnerabilities. That's that usually means oh yeah, there's some reg regex and it will take forever, which is you can ignore that. But the critical one that's a little scary, and. Uh, if you run it on the stuff that we uh, build at SUSE, you'll get this. I would take that with a pinch of salt because, well, actually with a big one, because if you run Trivi on the RHEL images, you'll get, an, you'll get a non-zero amount of vulnerability, so I guess Trivi is just not so good at scanning slash images. But you'll get medium at most and no high, no critical, at least when I checked it was the case. So. Yes, we know how to do security, and the cloud native world is slowly catching up and realizing if we just start pulling random images from Docker Hub, and they were updated a year ago, maybe there's these things called CVEs in them, and occasionally they are bad. <laughs> what a surprise, right? And there's also additional stuff. So we have so uh, we provide support, we have a bunch of integrations, so there's, there's Kubernetes runtimes, there's stuff like SUSE Manager, Ansible, Canonical has their stuff for this as well. We have build tools, and I know OpenShift is much more than a build tool and the open build service is not a product, but uh, <laughs> 
it's stuff that you can use in conjunction with these uh, with the enterprise distro but again the problem remains the same this is not this is an add-on to the enterprise distro this is not something that makes really the enterprise distro more appealing it just means you get the distro itself and this thing that works with it which i'm afraid will ultimately end up with the case where some suit very very high up much higher than myself in, in this company will come down and say yes SUSE manager or rancher they are making cash you guys aren't they aren't coming to, to, to us because of uh, because of SLES they are coming here because of whatever else so you aren't getting this additional job position and I'm very much afraid of this situation because it's going to be a death by a thousand paper cuts. So we are at a crossroad. And so to, to not end on a just negatives, what can we do about that? I think one, one thing that we really can do is focus on development tools. Mm, we should have done the same thing that Ubuntu did 15, 20 years ago when they made a great Linux desktop and essentially caught everyone to work on Ubuntu, which meant that all the developers brought Ubuntu into the business and now everything runs on Ubuntu or on Alpine because Alpine is small, but we don't have to be the smallest. Uh, so, but we all know the state of the Linux desktop on enterprise distros. It's a sad state and I'm afraid it's not gonna get any better anytime soon maybe someone can change that but uh, I, I don't see that happening anytime soon really so we can try work on dev tools and uh, we should because if you take a look at our own Java development container image that I also built so I I'm going point fingers at myself and this thing doesn't in contain gradle I'm sorry, that's a joke. I mean, who develops Java still with Maven, some old project? If you want to do Java development, you use Gradle. If you want to do Node.js development, you also want Yarn, and you don't want the docs to tell you that you should get Yarn from NPM. So your dev tools should really be in all the stuff. And yes, I know how much of a nightmare it is to build Gradle as an RPM, but Hmm? Yes, or maybe we have to we have to find another way. So the world is changing around us, and we have to adapt. And the old ways will not work like this forever. And I mean, at some point, we might have to relax our packaging guidelines and maybe start work together with the vendors because there's a company behind Gradle, and they are also getting interested in a secure supply chain. And if you're uh, one of our pitches is having a secure supply chain. You can collaborate with them. We can work together. And uh, then there's also, so really get development tools into container images so that it will re again become interesting to develop on an enterprise distro. And if I need to download all the stuff myself, I can put that on my workstation as well. And another thing is also um, an idea that I kind of stole from Adam Meyer, who made that for, for Node.js, and that is work on uh, really provide curated, so focus on certain dependencies. As I said, we can't package the world, but we can package the important stuff, and we can maintain the important stuff. So imagine that's well, probably not a million, but uh, I don't know how many packages there's on PyPI, but we can't package them. But if you take a look at your average Python project, there's the usual suspects, and out of those usual suspects, there's a few that talk to the internet. Requests, AIO, HTTP. So that's usually the stuff that would be, that y you should take care of that it really works. So how about we do the following? We package really those critical binaries. We provide, doesn't have to be a proxy or something that sits in between your Python package manager and PyPI. And you get most of your dependencies from PyPI and the security critical stuff you get from your RPMs. 
and then the enterprise distro can do their job with the important things, make it secure, ensure that there's no that there's no bad stuff happening, and the rest you will get from you will get from upstream directly. And another option would be something of a limited modularity. So I know again didn't work the first time. So how how about we do it differently? The f the big issue with uh, with modularity is if you try to piece too many this uh, too many deeply connected pieces together, uh, you get in this combination hell that you just can't maintain. Uh, but what about bundling your development stacks together? I mean, most customers or most developers they want they want a relatively recent Python. I mean, I'd like to. I'd like Python 3.11, but 3.9 is okay too. Um, and they want some Java, mostly a recent one. But if you bundle them together, test them together, and forbid these crazy combinations of everything, you can uh, you can limit the amount of work and QA that you have to do. If you limit the um, uh, if you limit the life cycle of these, it will still be more maintainable than having. Python 3.6 or 3.7 or whatever at the release of that came out at the release of your enterprise distro. So and then maybe you can still throw applications on top of that, but just don't make it possible to combine everything. And for the love of God, ma make those two development stacks conflict with each other. D don't don't allow various combinations of that. Yeah, and with that, uh, since I have still a few minutes left, I'm going to use it for a quick commercial break. So, s since there's probably packages around, and if you want to edit RPM spec files, and you're annoyed with editor support, we have written a tool for you during a hack week with a few colleagues. If you want to give it a try, uh, it's essentially a language server for editing RPM spec files. And actually that's also kind of the end of the talk. And I'm, since I see people still taking photos, uh, I'm just going to keep the, keep the QR code in here. And now we can go to the favorite part, the roasting session. So if you have questions, comments, hate mail, now is your chance. So looking at the new modularity approach, it sounds a lot like uh, runtimes for flat packs. Mm, I mean, you could use it to develop uh, to build a runtime for a flat pack out of that. Sure, because the run the flat packs is plus the packages itself, the flat packs, and they are runtimes which have the base uh, libraries you need to actually build the flat pack and those are not changed that often so it's still somewhat compatible with everything so this looks similar so you have some kind of base tools or base libraries that will be still there and you will build on top of that yeah yeah uh, I'm, I must confess I'm not that familiar with flat packs, so that's kind of an accident, but yes, it makes sense. So I'm not saying it's a bad approach, I just uh, think that it looks like it's really similar. Um, to be honest, I think this new modularity is exactly the old modularity, and like I would propose maybe separate this a conversation is that modularity as a concept, there is nothing bad about it. This is a super logical thing and like we obviously need it in some form. Modularity is about like, I want to group packages, I want to get have alternatives and I want to be able to manage that. Uh, like modularity doesn't, didn't never imply that you have supposed to combine anything with anything. It means like you have choices 
and you can make decisions how you group your stacks, your packages, and so on. And of course, like flat text is one form of modu modu modularity approach in general. Containers is another form of a modularity approach. There could be more ideas how we can mod modularize things. Like it's a generic problem. So I think that uh, like we today and um, yesterday we we used to laugh about modularity, but honestly, there's nothing bad in, in this concept, and <laughs> there is no reason not to investigate and dig into it and deeper and find alternatives. The issue with modularity in Fedora was basically the implementation de decisions which we made, especially on the built infrastructure tools, but like, it is not the end of the world. We can make more attempts, better attempts in the future, and like, why not? So let's do it. <laughs> Yes, please. Can can we pick a different name than modularity? <laughs> it's a little I, I am. Uh, <laughs> if you take a look at my GitHub and take a look how I call projects, don't ask me. <laughs> I'm the worst person. Uh, I'm the worst person in name giving. So. I agree with all of your problems that you've identified. I'm the product manager for Red Hat Enterprise Linux server, so I think about all of everything that you said all the time. Um, but I do want to ask, like, do you think it's really necessary to bundle things like this locked together? Because aren't some of the low-level things, uh, I guess let me ask your opinion, like, do you believe that the low-level things like glibc and OpenSSL can be bundled once in the base OS or maybe in some layer between and then you can have sort of branching where it would, the dependency would drive down, not not a star. You know, you showed that dependency graph, but do you really believe it's a graph, or do you believe you can drive some directionality to it? What, what do you mean by directionality? Well, it or feels what? like it feels like at least just my gut feeling that there's certain things that are more important than other things. Like glibc is more important than a lot of other things. OpenSSL is a lot more important than a lot of other things. So if you package that once and then have all of the different versions of OpenJDK or Python or whatever, you know, not not all of those use those, but like, it feels like you you don't have to have a star graph, like where you you don't need as many versions of of glibc as you do. You Open don't JDK. want to, really, you don't want to. So I, so th there's certainly uh, there's a there's definitely customers who want to build their own C libraries or even kernel modules. Uh, well, for kernel modules, it would be the kernel, but f that that build their that build their applications that rely on specific. Uh, that rely that glibc is this and that, and they want to keep it running on the base OS for all eternity. So for for them, you don't want to give them the choice. And the problem is if you really give them the choice of a glibc of an open SSL or the compiler or whatever, you have to rebuild all of these stacks for all of the different versions. And you you are, you are back to square one to this nightmare of combinations, so I wouldn't recommend that. Fix the base OS. I mean, what some people call nightmare, the other people call business opportunity. Uh, like, <laughs> they, 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 they. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but the, the people that call it business opportunity usually don't calculate the cost no, correctly. I, I think, uh, like, uh, I would say, there, there's no, uh, we don't have to like say no, never, never do it. It's like, you, if you do it, this is how much effort it will take and this is how much. Uh, you know how cost. bad we are in estimating time it takes for software? Uh, <laughs> no, uh, the, the thing is like, uh, things are possible and there are like, Voyager is, is going there with like, uh, kill, uh, uh, like minimal lines of code and it's still still going and it's still supported and there is still someone who maintains it, right? So like we do have special use cases where things like this are needed if you if you pay for them and if you hire people to do them and if you as understand fully the costs associated to this. So I'd say uh, one way to advocate uh, to things like this is not to say 
do, this is going to be really, really bad, but rather this is going to be really, really costly. And <laughs> this is, uh, I think, a better like chain of arguments uh, when, when we are discussing what you should and what you should not do in development. <laughs> Yes, so I I totally agree with that. The problem with uh, the the problem with this is going to be really really costly is uh, that, that, that I see what's going to happen. You make make some kind of estimate, and then it goes to sales, and someone is going to uh, going to push the price down, and uh, they are going to sell it anyway because I need that commission, and you're in a mess. And it comes down to people problems again. Sorry? It's due right now. Uh, so, you know, as you were talking, uh, you know, Scott was talking about this whole, like, maybe it's a directed star thing or whatever, rather than the web of insanity. Um, I would think that, though, yeah, no, the, the, the web of insanity. That that's I have never seen Tumbleweeds Ring One visualized that way, and I don't think I want to. Hulo did that. It's still on his website. Oh God, please! If you want to make your browser spin for two hours, you can open it. Yeah, no, I'm not gonna. <laughs> but uh, you know, I think there's something in between what you're talking about, what Scott talks about, because. I mean, to some extent, we're already doing this in Tumbleweed with the Ring Zero, Ring One, Ring Two, and then the full factory boots, the full factory project. But the thing we don't do uh, right now is that we don't try to enforce, um, uh, we, don't, we don't provide any friction between the layers uh, to try to figure out whether there is a way to um, make each layer self-sustaining on top of each other, like basically they, instead of being things that change the underlying layers, that they're basically hole punches all the way up. Uh, that might be a way to make this limited modularity thing work. Um, I actually don't know if it would be, so I don't even know if this would work. Uh, because the whole stack thing, even like if you look at how flat packs are built, they are basically a distribution inside of a distribution inside of it with an application that happens to be crazy glued on top. And so like, you know, I don't know if that makes any sense either. So this is a ramble of a comment based on what you've been talking about. I don't know if I have a This has been a ramble as well, so we're good. <laughs> and I'm afraid we're really out of time, right? Oh. Thanks for having me.